I'll hit 350 miles in these Saucony Endorphin Speed this week. I want to talk about my experience with them over the last year and I'll show you how they've held up. Now, as a spoiler, I love them and they've been really durable and I'm going to keep buying Endorphin Speed. But I'll tell you at the end whether I'm going to wait for the Speed 4 in May 2024 or stick with the Speed 3. So here's a summary list of the eight key technical details and features listed on the Saucony site about the Speed 3. I'll go through each of these in turn and we'll try and figure out what they're talking about with some of them. Let me start with weight. Uh, at 8.1 ounce or 230 grams for a US size 9, it's a pretty lightweight. I like my shoes as light as possible and I'm willing to trade off cushioning to get that. Uh, my own rule is that I wouldn't buy a shoe over a 10 ounce 284 gram spec and I try and keep it below 9 ounces. For reference, a, a 2 ounce or a 57 gram difference in each shoe means you're effectively running with the additional weight of 10 quarters or 8 euros or if you're in the UK 7 pound coins in each shoe. So multiply that by the number of strides in a run and it's a lot of wasted energy and it, it may be real or imagined but either way shoe weight seems to have a big effect on my run. What about the phrase speed roll? What does that mean? Well it's a catchy sound and summary of the geometry of the midsole. Saucony claims that the unique design gives you a kind of roll and then push forward sensation. They apply this speed roll moniker to the design of their entire endorphin range. So, you know, pro, shift, speed, elite. That includes the shift, which doesn't have any kind of midsole play in it. Now, I've run in the shift and it does have that kind of sensation, but I feel it more with the speed because of the additional effects of its nylon plate. Talking about the plate, this is inserted into the middle of two slices of the midsole foam. The larger part of the plate, the base, is in the forefoot of the shoe and the slimmer end curves up into the heel at the rear. And this rear part acts like a springboard, giving you a push forward, and the broader end, more anchored and stiff at the front, gives you a kind of rocker action to give you your toe off. And that kind of complements the speed roll geometry. Uh, the plate itself is nylon in the speed instead of carbon plated with the goal of being a little less harsh and more flexible, making the shoe more forgiving on your feet for longer runs. And that's been my experience. Look at the difference in flexibility here between my Speed 3 and my Endorphin Pro 1s. You feel that stiffness after a few miles. And in contrast, the plate on the speed here is very rarely intrusive. The other element of the plate on the speed is that it has a slight wing in the middle of the foot. And although the speed is definitely a neutral and not a stability shoe, this wing does add a bit of support if you are prone to pronation. You can actually see it here in my pair on the sides here. See the metal here on either side curving up a little bit. I have to say a couple of times in my early days of running in the shoes I would feel the side here a little when my form would start to break down and although it was a bit uncomfortable it actually served as a bit of a reminder to focus on my footfall. Then in terms of heel to toe offset and stack the shoe stack height is 36 millimeters at the rear and 28 millimeters at the front for an 8 millimeter drop. So drop is basically the difference in height between your heel and your forefoot and the higher the drop the more slope down your foot is. 8 millimeters is kind of in the middle for drop. You see general guidance that more than a 6 millimeter drop is best for heel strikers and less for forefoot or midsole ones. And I guess this is related to the assertion that you need more calf and ankle flexibility for a lower drop, which is moving some of the impact forces off the knee to the lower leg. I really have knee problems, but I do have stiff and relatively weak ankles. I also tend to land midsole in general, but I touch more towards my heel when I get tired. So I feel that my drop preference has gravitated towards 8 to 10 millimetres and away from 4 to 6 millimetres, as I've come to kind of realise that. And certainly, again, when I compare my 8 millimetre drop in the speeds to the 4 millimetre drop on my Pro 1s, I do feel that difference in my ankles. 
The stack height of 36 here is fairly low and I, I certainly have no sensation of instability in the shoes. But having said that, the stack height of the Speed 1, which I used to have, was about the same and I felt very unstable in those. And the big difference here and something I love in the Speed 3 is the slightly wider heel area and the significantly wider base of the shoe. And when you combine the speed roll effect with how solid that base is, it's actually a very satisfactory, comfortable sensation on the landing of these. Now, compared to the other brands I run in, primarily Adidas and Hoka, Saucony in general makes shoes where you definitely feel more ground contact. And I wouldn't call these speeds soft or super cushioned, but they're, they're absolutely not harsh. I don't like the way some super cushioned shoes almost divorce you from any connection to the road. And I think the speed are a great balance. You, you experience the kind of fun speed roll interaction with the road surface without feeling like that surface is pounding you into slabs of meat. I've run up to 15 miles, 24 kilometers in these shoes, and I've never felt my feet beat up at all. Part of that, of course, is the excellent midsole foam, which Saucony calls Power Run PB. And according to Saucony, Power Run PB is its premier cushioning material. It's a beaded foam made from a proprietary blend of PEBA polymers. Now, what does all that mean? Well, Saucony tells us on their site that Power Run PB is half the weight of EVA foam. It's a dramatically more durable. But what is PEBA and why is Saucony comparing it to EVA? Well, PEBA is polyether block amide and EVA is ethylene vinyl acetate. Basically, they're different types of lightweight thermoplastic elastomers that get all foamed up by the introduction of air or gas into them. What's a thermoplastic elastomer? It's a springy rubber-like material that can be softened and molded through heating and then it hardens when it cools. Saucony's PEBA is made up of a bunch of round beads rather than a solid block. But why are they comparing PEBA to EVA anyway and why should we care? Well, if you want a real deep dive into running foams, there's a couple of fantastic podcasts from the Doctors of Running. I've put the reference up here. But if you'd rather not go far from the shallows now, here's a quick summary. You can think about the efficiency of running shoe midsoles in terms of weight, energy storage, energy return and durability. Now we talked about the effect of weight earlier, but let's cover the other elements. When you land on a shoe as part of your stride, you exert a force and some of that energy will be transferred into the shoe's foam. Now, only a relatively small amount of that energy you're exerting will get stored in the foam, like way less than 10%. And exactly how much will depend in part on how stiff it is. So the less stiff or more soft the foam is, the more it compresses and the more energy it will store. And multiple academic studies speak to both the beneficial energy storage and, of course, the comfort related to increased softness. So it's well established. And then as the foam springs back, much of the energy will be lost as heat, but some will be transferred back to you, and that's the energy return component. So you'll hear people also refer to energy return as resilience. So a shoe that absorbs and returns a lot of energy will give you a better energy expenditure, or you'll hear the phrase running economy, than a shoe that doesn't. So for running shoes, EVA was first on the scene as early as the 1970s, and then PEBA arrived much later. And in terms of energy return, EVA tends to have a range of energy return from about 60 to 65%. PEBA, which was introduced via the Nike Vaporfly as p in 2017, its energy return is typically 85% plus, and it's also significantly less stiff than EVA. Another positive component of PEBA is that it's significantly less dense than EVA, making it lighter too. Although these general differences in the characteristics exist, the way that PEBA and EVA is formed can make a big difference. For example, instead of a straightforward blowing of air to foam up a sole, you might hear references to supercritical fluids or supercritical foam. And these are usually CO2 or nitrogen or a blowing agent 
that are in a state essentially between that of a gas and a fluid, and it's used to create a kind of specific architecture of the foam to improve characteristics like lowering density or making the foam softer. Each shoe company starts with an EVA or a PEBA or another type called TPU, which is thermal plastic polyurethane. They start with one of these or a combination of them, but they end up essentially having a proprietary foam in part due to the way that they foam it up. Here's a nice article here on what kind of shoes use what kind of foam base. And you, you see, for example, that Saucony uses a TPU base in some shoes, which they call Power Run Plus, and an EVA base in others, which they call Power Run. And then, of course, the PEBA is a Power Run PB. So manufacturers keep their exact midsole foam specifications proprietary in. Therefore, although Saucony can make general claims about PEBA versus EVA overall, it and we are not really directly able to compare one manufacturer's shoe foam versus another in terms of either resilience or softness or durability. And all I mean by durability is how well the properties of a foam hold up over time. So I'll give you my perspective later on how well the Speed 3 foam has done over 350 miles, and I'll compare it to others I've tried but it will be totally subjective. But before that, let's talk about the, the outsole on the specified XT900 rubber. How well does that protect the midsole foam? Well, according to Saucony, it's a premium carbon rubber outsole which offers exceptional traction and high wear properties. Here's a look at it in my new pair. And you can see it's a pretty large area that the rubber covers. It's not raised a ton above the foam, but it's enough to give you plenty of protection. I don't think it's quite as grippy as the Continental rubber on Adidas shoes. Here's a side-by-side -side photograph with the Adidas Prime X. But when it comes to wear and durability, as I'll discuss later, I think it's every bit as good. But let's finish the specification discussion by talking about what Saucony calls its form fit design. What does form fit mean? Well, here's a link to Saucony's video on the subject. I've watched it three or four times. It's only about a minute and there's no real content in it other than it's saying they have a nice comfy insole in addition to this two slices of midsole foam. And don't get me wrong, it's a nice insole, quite thick, and it does add a touch of cushion in it and it does kind of conform to your foot. What about the rest of the upper? Well, I really like most of it. Um, even though it's a light shoe, the, the tongue is thick enough that you can tie it tight without any lace rub on your feet. There's a really nicely secured gusset way down in here. And that really cradles my foot. And another thing I really like compared to the earlier speed iterations is that the, the toe box here is nice and wide. Now, they even do a wide version of the shoe, but I haven't needed it even though I felt tight in the speed ones and twos. Having said that, with all my Saucony shoes, I, I do take a half size higher than I do in Adidas, for example. Some people have mentioned in reviews that the heel could do with a bit more cushion. But I certainly haven't found that. And, and I've got a very thin heel skin thickness on my right foot, in particular following an Achilles repair when I was younger. So I'm pretty sensitive to heel rubbing, but I've never had an issue here with these. In terms of the front of the upper, this is a part I really like. Despite the fact that it feels relatively thick and, and almost plush, the aeration here works extremely well, even in my Florida summers. Usually the first part of a Saucony to wear for me has been this kind of front of the upper here near the toes. Both my Freedoms and my Canvaras were here first, but the Speed seems to have that extra durability and you can see there's little to no wear here. My only upper issue with these has been with these rope style laces. And unless you really tightly double knot them, it kind of comes loose quite easily. I was relieved to see these more traditional softer, flatter laces in my new pair. Overall, I think it's a nice looking shoe as well. It's not too chunky um, and it's not too long looking. So how has the shoe been for me over 350 miles, 563 kilometers? Well, it's been fantastic. Here's how I've used it. Um, I've run 53 times in them for an average distance of 6.6 .6 miles or 10.6 kilometers, my longest distance 
was 15 miles and my shortest was a two mile race I ran this year. I've used them for three main purposes. Firstly, and my prime purpose, they're my speed training shoe. I'm generally training for longer races like half and full marathons. So my speed training isn't all out and it's often over longer distances like 800 meters to a mile. Sometimes as well, I'll use them on a three to six mile tempo run. And I have to say, if the type of speed and tempo training I do, and that's in the range of seven to eight minute miles, 421 to 458 minute kilometers, that they're really perfect. The shoes also work really well for the warm up and cool down component of speed training. And that leads to my second use case. They are my all purpose shoe for traveling. So while they're most comfortable at the higher end of my pace range, I know they'll work too for easy runs. And some faster shoes kind of scream at you for going too slow, but I never feel that with these. Now, having said that, you might find yourself drifting into a faster pace than usual in an easy run with these. But nonetheless, when I take one pair of shoes on a trip, it's the Speed 3. And then my final use case, I've started running 5K races and also the two miler I mentioned in them. I notice a little bit of a drop off in perceived propulsion versus the Endorphin Pro I used to use, but... I really don't think the difference is that significant. And I've got other issues with my speed in 5Ks than the type of shoes I'm wearing. And that's the great strength of the Endorphin Speed 3. It's got a great range of uses. Now, where will it fit in my shoe rotation in 2024? Well, I'll use my older Saucony Triumph 20s at half for recovery runs. I'll use my Hokamak 5s for easy runs. I'll use the speeds for speed work up to five miles and for shorter races. I'll use ASIC Super Blast for my long runs and then my long race shoes will be my Endorphin Elite. Now, realistically, I could do it all with the speeds and the Super Blast, but, you know, I've got a shoe problem. How about the durability of the speeds? Here's the right shoe of my 350 mile pair. And that's compared to the right shoe of my new ones. So I'm starting to lose significant tread at the lateral part of the heel and the medial part of the front, as expected. That coming off of the rubber that you see at the lateral heel is very recent after 300 miles and wasn't part of a result of a kind of skipping drill I was doing before a race where I kind of scraped my heel along the ground inadvertently. However, here's my Adidas Prime X at 264 miles, 425 kilometers by comparison. You can see the Continental rubber maybe wears a little bit better at the front, but here at the rear, it's just a bit of a wreck. And I could have put up with this heel wear a, a touch longer maybe, but the carbon rods here are all squeaky now and they kind of drive me and anybody running with me mad like a Chinese water drip torture. So I've kind of retired these. So going back to the speeds, the wear in the outsole is my prime reason for considering retiring these speeds at 350 miles. But you can also see here in comparison between my new ones and my 350 mile pair that the foam on the side is starting to crack up a little bit. Now, I can't say I've noticed a big drop-off in responsiveness yet, whereas I definitely did feel a big difference in the responsiveness of my Adidas shoes. Um, I've had the Adidas Adi Zero Pro 2, the Pro 3, and the Prime X, and they all feel much duller after 200 to 250 miles, let alone 350 miles. And I have to say I've felt the same with the Endorphin Pro. So... I do expect when I lace up the new Speed 3s in early January that I will feel a difference between them and these with the foam start to crack. But if not, I'll maybe try and squeak another 50 miles out of these. So overall, I love these shoes and they've been really durable. And I'm definitely going to stick with the Saucony Endorphin Speed. I know there's a plan for an Endorphin Speed 4 coming out in May, but here are the reasons why I'm going to stick with the Speed 3 for 2024. The first is that I expect the change to the 4 won't be a substantial one. It was such a huge development between the 2 and the 3, and also between the older and the newer versions of the Endorphin Pro and the Endorphin Shift, that I believe what we'll see next in the Endorphin range is much more of a fine-tuning than a drastic change. And that certainly seemed to be the pattern with the Saucony Ride and Triumph shoes. The changes between the Ride 14 and 15 were huge, 
but the newer 16 was iterative. And similarly, the Triumph 20 was a big jump from the 19, but the change to the current 21 was less drastic. Now, of course, even a minor improvement, saying the weight is a good thing, but that's where, for me, price is a big factor. The list price of these is 170, but these replacement pair I got in a Saucony Thanksgiving sale, 25% off at $127.50. And while they're currently full price again, I think you'll find discounts between now and the launch of the Speed 4 in May. And a likely $50 say difference between the three and the four is enough for me. So if you get a chance of a discounted pair of Endorphin Speed 3 and some of the things I've said about my use case and what's important to me and a shoe resonate with you, then I would have no hesitation in recommending you go for it. I hope this video has been interesting and maybe even useful for you. If it has, please give me a like and consider subscribing to an old man running. Maybe you could even share it with someone considering a new pair of shoes. Thank you.